I'm, uh, I'm sorry to tell you that this is the last design at large of the quarter. Uh, and, uh, and it's been, uh, it's been a, a, another special quarter of design at large. I just really like the speakers. It's been very interesting. And, and, uh, and just in case you're worried what to do at this time next week, we're going to have an unofficial design at large. Uh, with uh, some speakers that run an uh, uh, interesting lab in Paris. It's joint between University of Paris and Enria. It's called the Ex Situ Lab, and they look at extreme users, uh, folks like composers and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, and I don't know where we'll have it. We might have it here. We're still looking at that. Or we might have it in a design lab. You know, if you're taking class for credit, you, know, you don't have to come at all. You should focus on your finals and your projects. Uh, but if you want to come, uh, you're more than welcome, and I'll send out a note to everyone uh, about that. Um, I think the, uh, you know, the quarter's been really interesting for me. I mean, you know, folks taking the uh, course for credit uh, participated in a discussion forum uh, on Piazza. And uh, I looked last night, there's been uh, almost 600 posts uh, uh, over the quarter, uh, all very thoughtful uh, kinds of posts. And, one thing I was thinking about, we were talking about a little bit before, is I'm thinking of a way to sort of maybe involve speakers in that discussion forum. And one thing I was thinking was maybe having a sort of opportunity to, um, for the forum to talk about some questions that they might like to ask the speaker, and maybe by discussing those, improve them, and then maybe vote on them and have one or two of those questions go to the speaker. Because uh, we don't want to inundate them with questions, but it might be nice to get uh, that kind of connection. So we've had, uh, I'm very pleased we've had uh, seven of our nine speakers have been women, uh, which is, I think, a really uh, important thing uh, for these kinds of talks. Uh, and, uh, and, the, uh, and so, uh, so I want to introduce uh, our executive vice chancellor. I'm really nervous about uh, interviews. <laughs> Elizabeth Simmons uh, just started with us this year. Uh, so she's new to the university, but she's really not new to academia. Uh, she's a physicist, a uh, particle physicist. Uh, she got her bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Harvard. Uh, seemed to like it there because she stayed on as a postdoc. Uh, along the way, I think after you got your master's degree, you went to Cambridge University, uh, to study, also to study physics. And, and got a master's degree from Cambridge. Uh, her academic career has, uh, I think, started at Boston University uh, and then moved to Michigan State. It's sort of a, you know, I was looking at her CV uh, and it's just very, you know, as I turn page after page of, of all kinds of things, it reminded me, I, I did a postdoc at Stanford and uh, worked with a guy, uh, Pat Soupies. And when I was going there, uh, Pat sent me his CV, and I thought, well, I just shouldn't go, you know, just so uh, impressive. I had that same kind of feeling of looking at all the kinds of, yeah. of things she's done. Uh, I think one of the things I noticed is, is she's been writing a column for Inside Higher Education since 2011, uh, and it's sort of a uh, career advice column in lots of ways uh, for academics, and if you're a faculty member or a future faculty member, there's Lots of good information uh, there. And uh, today, uh, she's going to give us some advice, I think, uh, about things. And she's going to talk about uh, achieving, achieving proactive leadership via design uh, uh, from scramble to process. So Elizabeth so Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk with you today. Um, I've been um, in. I guess now almost 15 years in, the, uh, in academic leadership. And um, I discovered over the time that it's, it's really easy to fall into kind of a reactive mode where things come at you, particularly with email, right? Things are being thrown at you all day long, solve this, solve that. And it's really, eager, it's really easy to um, fall into a mode of just reacting to these things linearly, one by one as they come at you. And then it's, that makes it really hard to have your unit make any progress towards whatever its big goals are, like helping more students graduate or um, uh, making sure that really a diverse group of faculty actually stay and succeed and get promoted. And um, 
So along the way, I started to think about um, how could we do things better? How could we do things in a different way? And I found, looking back, that a lot of the time it um, came down in a way to getting a picture in my mind, literally an image that might help me organize my thinking. And I found that a lot of the times, things that we were just scrambling to keep up with, if we designed a process deliberately, it would enable us to not simply accomplish the task, but do it better, have um, side effects that we could never get the other way that we were doing it, and um, ultimately um, have time left over for other big important things that we ought to be spending time on. So I was going to give you a few examples um, of these. And oh, I was told that these are the good pens. So I'm going to get these, not to malign those pens. I'm told these will work. <laughs> Right? They might be listening to me. Um, so one of the things, um, so where, where, I, where I used to work at Michigan State, um, uh, so the way that teaching was organized, regular semester courses in a classroom, face to face, there, there was a way all that was budgeted. If you wanted to do anything creative, like study abroad or hybrid courses or um, things in spring break, anything a little bit unusual, uh, it, was, it was really run on kind of a self-funding model. And so you'd find that um, you would have to somehow magically find some money from somewhere. And then out of that, out of that money, you would then there would be a bunch of expenses that you might be paying. And uh, so you'd pay for maybe people to teach the course. Maybe you had to pay for field trips, maybe lab supplies, whatever it was that you needed. And then um, at, at the end, um, you would either, you know, that course would either be in trouble and then you'd wonder if you'd ever get to run it again or it might, it might be good, you might be in the green, you might then put some of that back into fund the next year and then you'd have a self-perpetuating cycle. That was great. Um, but if you ended up here, it was a problem. It might put the thing in jeopardy. And uh, there was always the question of where was that initial money going to come from? And so uh, we had several different study abroad programs and um, oh, a medical terminology course run, uh, run um, in the summers, because it turns out if you want to go to a physical therapy school or you want to go to med school or what have you, there's a lot of arcane terminology that you might want to start learning. And students really love that course. So these were all separate. And so I would have this scramble where every year someone would come to me and say, well, you know, we want to do a study abroad course in Peru, but we don't know if the site we're thinking of is good. You know, we have to go make a site visit and see, can they accommodate the students in, in the hostel there? And I'd have to somehow magically find the money to do this. And then one day I got an image in my mind of a waterfall. And I got an image, in fact, of, so a waterfall, with maybe several different streams coming down and then falling onto a, a rock face. And I guess this is where I want. I should be using blue, right? I'd, so several, several different streams coming down and the water falling onto a rock face and kind of flowing along it, maybe down another fall, and then ultimately into some sort of a, some sort of a, sort of a basin here. And that image, I realized that what I was thinking of was maybe there were little, sometimes with those big flat rocks, you get like little, little hollows in the rock, like you see sort of in tide pool areas. And so I realized that you could, maybe you'd have something like that as the water flowed along, maybe some water would get caught in there. And these were the separate courses. Each one would be generating, maybe from year to year, different amounts of extra money. And they'd be different sizes. Some might be really profitable, some not so profitable. Maybe it would switch from year to year. But if you let all the money flow together, and you said to yourself, I'm going to need, say, course development money uh, every year. And I'm going to need maybe some field trip money. And I'm going to have to pay the instructors. And I kind of know in aggregate what the different categories of expense are. And then anything extra can flow down here to the dean's favorite, the dean's discretionary fund, right? Where you can then go pay all sorts of other bills. And having this 
just this image of the waterfall had us, led us to um, redesign the entire financial system for all of these classes that were really fun. Everyone loved to teach them, the students loved to take them. But they'd been so difficult in this model. Um, what I was, of course, trying to explain to my, um, to my um, MSO that I wanted to in try this waterfall model. OK, this was a long series of conversations because just getting the picture out of my head and into, but, but once, once I, I had it into some, some uh, you know, more concrete terminology, it worked. And then it, was, then it was easy. This could then fund new courses, for example, or that special trip you had to make to Peru before running the course. So this was a case where an image and designing a process led to um, much better outcomes. We were able to run far more programs. And um, we always had, we even were able to add a new basin that we'd never had before, uh, we, a line that we hadn't had there. We were, we were able to add one for student scholarships because we realized that a lot of our students who um, uh, maybe came from um, uh, less privileged backgrounds couldn't afford to go on study abroad. And suddenly, we had a pool of money that we could use to give out scholarships. And then it diversified who was going on study abroad and doing these different courses. And that was just a whole new goal we'd never been able to meet. But it aligned with one of the big goals that, um, that, that our division had. So that's kind of the first, that's the first example I wanted to talk about, the waterfall. Um, let's see. Oh, yes. So. Another example, um, so one of the big things that you, that you do is, as, a, as a dean is that you have to make sure that the number of faculty available to teach courses matches the number of courses you think you're running next year. And usually about this time of year, um, I would start having this really frantic email exchange with um, various, various uh, members of, of my team with the uh, head of budget, the head of HR, the um, associate dean in charge of personnel, and the associate dean in charge of curriculum. And we'd have this five-way, very frantic email exchange um, about, uh, wait a second, who's going to teach Chem 1? Well, isn't Josie teaching Chem 1? No, she's going on sabbatical. Uh-oh, we've got to hire somebody. And it, this would go on just round and round, and we discover at the last minute, oh my gosh, how are we paying for the person to teach this? And so on and so forth. And so you can imagine five people sitting in their different offices, lobbing email at one another. And it really wasn't, it really wasn't a great system. Moreover, we had five separate little spreadsheets that we were each looking at, right? Each in our offices. And I've drawn them sort of similarly, but in fact, each one was different because um, I wanted all the information, and the finance person just wanted to know, uh, were we going to afford this? And the HR person wanted to know, were we hiring people in accordance with union regulations? So we, all ha we had all these different sub spreadsheets with subsidiary info until one day it occurred to us that we could have one sheet to rule them all, right? We could have one big shareable spreadsheet with different things and maybe I mostly cared about this this part and the HR person would kind of look at an overlapping set with me but that was fine we could have overlapping we could have non overlapping and best of all we would never have to wonder again or rack our brains to remember who was going to pay for the course that Josie should have been teaching but she was off on sabbatical um, and so the the scramble subsided in that we weren't lobbying emails at one another. So that was better. But then we realized that there was kind of another problem, a deeper layer of problem, that we had never been able to realize was existing because we were so consumed with our separate spreadsheets and the problem of who was teaching this one course tomorrow. And we realized that that problem was um, we, uh, ran an analysis, now with our spare time of not emailing each other, um, we ran an analysis, analysis to say, looking across the division, who is teaching our courses? 
And we discovered to our shock that a really high proportion of certain courses were being taught by people who were being hired just one year at a time. And too low a proportion was being taught by people with long-term jobs, teaching professors or, or ladder rank faculty or, or, or what have you. And we realized this is, this is really not what we wanted. We wanted our students to be able to know um, that the faculty who were with them were people who um, had chosen a career in teaching. They were going to be in the college division. Sorry, we called it a college. In the division, they were familiar with it. They um, knew the curriculum. They knew how it connected together, all those things. And um, we also realized that this was really stressful on the long-term people in the unit who had to keep running searches every year for someone to fill in this or that course. And so I had to ask myself, how had we gotten there? And it was partly because of the, the method that we'd used of thinking of it course by course. How will we pay for this course? And feeling, well, we, we don't have enough money for another teaching professor because we don't have recurring long-term funds for it. But then I realized from this analysis, once you just looked at the data, well, every year for the last five years, I had hired um, basically five different one-year individuals to teach courses in the history, philosophy, and sociology of science. And every year for the last eight years, I'd hired someone or other to teach math courses and so on. And if I looked year by year, the source of the funding was different. This person went on leave. That person went on leave. So-and-so got a grant. But every year, something happened so that I needed the course taught and money appeared from somewhere. So I realized that it would be a better bet to take the risk and say, let's redesign our faculty. Let's hire those five historians and philosophers of science. Let's hire that extra mathematician. And it's going to be OK. We have years of data showing that we need this. The enrollments are stable. And so we did it. We took the plunge and said, we'll redesign the faculty. And we, um, we're going to hire them all, actually, as uh, teaching faculty, given the, gi just given the particular situation. Um, and uh, that meant we thought we had to sort of think about that, right? We said, well, we've redesigned the faculty, but we know that this will be better for the students, but what will it be like for the faculty? Are we designing a good experience for the faculty we're bringing in? We realized, oh, they can't vote on anything. <coughs> And um, you know, where are their offices going to be? And uh, how are they going to serve on governance committees? And so we realized that we had to go through the whole governance structure, the whole voting structure, all of that, and redesign that to be in accordance with the faculty that we were going to have with us. And so then we hired the individuals. We could do cluster hires, right? Because you're bringing in a bunch of people at once. And it was amazing, just by thinking about how we wanted to design the faculty, we ended up with higher morale, nobody having to do a million searches. The faculty were there because they wanted a career teaching, and they wanted to be there for the long term. It wasn't just a temporary thing on the way somewhere else. The students were happier because they got to know the faculty. And um, it had, had all these really interesting side effects, just having sat back and, and, and um, realized what the issue was and what a different picture would look like. And then that was when we realized that we'd really solved what we could only partially see here when we were lobbying emails. That was the first layer, peeling that away, let us see the deeper problem. And then we were able to design our way out of that. And um, uh, it, really, it really changed the fabric. It changed the fabric of the college and left everybody more time to work on other things. So then we went, on to, um, we went on to awards. So every year, the university would um, send out emails in maybe, um, oh, say, in, in late September, saying, don't forget, our university offers this award, that award, that come centrally. And then there would be the international office would send out its list. Remember, nominate people for the EDI office, and so on. And these would come. And they would come 
that for us in the middle was in the middle of the term. We were on semesters. So these would arrive at a time when you were busy with many other things. And so then the invitation to nominate people for awards would look like an imposition. Oh boy, I'm busy. How will I do that? We realized also it meant that if you, weren't, if you were scrambling to figure out who to nominate, the same people might always get nominated for the awards. And so I thought about that and I realized even though the invitations to nominate kept coming at different times during the year, they were pretty much always the same awards year to year. So if you looked long term at the pattern of it, you knew when the awards, when, when the awards were, when you were going to have to do the nominations. And there was a particular time of year every spring when the division had done its uh, merit review process. And uh, there was an elected committee and they reviewed everybody's biobib and everything that the people had been doing the last year and their essays about what they'd done. And then that group would figure out its recommendations and then sit down with me for a whole day and we would go through everybody's file and figure out, um, uh, essentially it was making um, recommendations toward merit increases, toward salary increases ultimately. Um, and I realized that at the end of that day, you had a room full of, um, I guess there would have been five of us in the room, with our brains all completely full of all the information about all the great stuff everybody in the unit had done for the last year. And that was the moment when we could actually do award nominations in a good way. And all we had to do was just have a list of names versus awards. You just had to have a simple, a simple spreadsheet and you could, you could uh, fill that in and you could say, well look, this person, because certain awards you had to have been at the university so many years maybe, like you had to have been here, uh, so that you'd have this person's name and well, they couldn't be nominated for that award. So if you had your names, they couldn't be nominated for that award because they hadn't been there long enough. And they couldn't actually be nominated for this one because they'd been there too long. But in between somewhere, there'd be a block of awards you might be able to nominate them for. And you could, you could have it all kind of shaded. And then you could keep track of, well, actually, you know, this award, this person was nominated for last year and they won. So we're not going to do that again. And you filled it all out. And so you could just keep track of who's eligible, thinking about what we know about them, who are the right people to nominate this year. We could track it with things like, well, they're about to, they just went up for promotion this year. So we actually have external letters about them with more detail and we've already written lots of essays about them. So if we nominate them next fall, we have half the essays already written, it'll be really easy. <laughs> we'll save ourselves a lot of time and they'll feel happy because they got promoted and they got a prize, you know, so it's, it's all good. And since everyone gets promoted at some point, everyone has a fair chance to be the nominee because their names keep cycling to the top. And redesigning the process, it was great. We started our, f <laughs> it was a little embarrassing. We were a, a very small division, only, um, let's see, maybe 50 faculty, which as a division was pretty small uh, on that campus um, of 50,000 students. So um, uh, we started winning with embarrassing regularity because we had a system, you know, <laughs> and we had a process and we just designed a better way. But also now women were getting nominated, underrepresented minorities were getting nominated. People, we, we realized that, wow, there were a whole set of of um, awards that in fact the uh, teaching professors were actually eligible for once we looked into the rules and only ladder rank people had been nominated before. There were things that um, um, administrative staff were eligible for so suddenly we really were able to diversify that and that really improved morale. People felt that others cared about them and we also took nominating people for awards it had been this onerous thing of, oh my gosh, we've got to do it, we've got to do it by Friday, to sitting around and saying, 
wow, how can I help my colleagues? It became part of the spirit of the place that, of course, you'd put your colleagues up. Um, so it, 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 ha it had a lot of ripple effects. I know it seems like we did a lot with, with flat spreadsheets. That's um, <laughs> maybe um, the, uh, with this one, I had some picture in my mind of something more multidimensional, but um, whenever I tried to talk to our um, IT person about it, he was a little dubious because I couldn't quite, you know, make the, make the, make the five-dimensional picture for him. So um, I, think that, I think that was more, more my problem than his. Um, let's see. Let's, let's go to the one there's an image that um, there's a piece of, piece of paper that maybe could be handed around. So, um, yeah, so this will come your way. Um, I, um, one of the things I did, so I'd been dean for a long time, and the EVC there um, decided that um, the head of uh, the Office of Faculty and Organizational Development was retiring. And the EVC decided yeah. that um, uh, she wanted me to, I was going to continue being dean, but she wanted me to head up that office and um, do some work on faculty development across the university, uh, help new faculty learn how to get, uh, get started in their careers, how to plan for going up for promotion, how to help people who were thinking they might want to become a chair or a dean learn how to do that, um, all those sorts of things. And um, uh, so she asked me to head that up, and I'm going to take one copy of that for me so I can show you. So if you start by looking at this, this is just a representation. This is from the website of the old Office of Faculty and Organizational Development. And um, uh, this is, I guess, the menu, uh, the, the menu off the website of, of topics. And if you think about the name, Office of Faculty and Organi Organizational Development, office. So that's one central point in the university. Um, located as it happened in the um, administration building, which is kind of in the middle of campus. It's built in the brutalist architecture, which is just what its name sounds like, not a place that most people would feel really comfortable walking into that building and feeling like it was going to be a good experience. Um, and um, so let's see, office, uh, faculty, organization, um, it was, um, things you can see just from this, it was very hierarchical, very linear. Um, this is how things are going to be done. And because of that orientation of being the office of faculty development, there was a sense that um, it had to control all of the faculty development being done on campus. And so a lot of energy was expended on maintaining control. And so when I, when I came in to, um, to lead this, the EVC gave me uh, leeway to redesign it as need, <coughs> as need be. And in fact, I had to make a proposal to her about, um, about what I was thinking of doing. And um, what uh, my team and I came up with was instead what we fondly call the amoeba. And we, we reconceptualized, um, and it started with the name. So the, new, the name Academic Advancement Network. At Michigan State, the word faculty is reserved very specifically to ladder rank faculty. And there's uh, um, teaching professors are instead called academic staff. And there's that sort of hierarchical distinction. But we realized that everybody, um, all kinds of academics, were academics whether or not they had the label faculty. So we took faculty out of the name and put academic. We put advancement because the purpose is not for, not for us to tell people what they ought to be doing, but to help people advance in their own careers and the careers they want, the careers they're interested in. So we're there to help them. And network um, because the idea was to pull together all the different people doing that kind of work across campus, not to rule them, not to be in charge of them, not to tell them what to do, but to say, let's partner. If you over there in research services are helping people learn how to get grants, great. You do that, I'll do something else, but let's talk to each other. Let's coordinate. Let's, um, 
make sure that we communicate so faculty know where this, excuse me, so academics know, because here I can say faculty because it has a much broader meaning here, but there, so academics um, would know where to get the information. And so we worked with um, the library and IT and things out in the divisions and so on and established a network and so the um, the uh, amoeba shows how we were thinking of it. You can see, yes, we still had, um, uh, I had four different, um, what would they have been? So I was an associate vice chancellor, so they were assistant vice chancellors reporting to me, each in charge of mostly a different area that we worked a lot together. But the idea was there were these nodes that would be reaching out across campus and these little dots were signifying that there might be new nodes that could come into being over time. We didn't necessarily have the perfect concept, the ultimate design. So very different from this way of thinking about things. Um, and having the picture helped us figure out where we wanted to go and it helped us explain. When I, I had to give a speech about the Academic Advancement Network probably 50 times in the first year and so did my, my associate vice chancellors and we'd go in somewhere and just slap the amoeba up you know, on the projector and we'd say, okay, let me just talk about us a little and then you can ask questions. And it was, much, it was just much easier to explain what we were doing if we just showed the picture. And then people would get comfortable and they'd say, okay, you're not trying to steal my program, you're not, you don't want my money, you're just here to talk, it's okay. Which I find to be extremely ironic given that this looks like an amoeba. And what do amoebas do? They ooze along, they surround things, engulf them, and digest them. <laughs> so in fact, <laughs> but, but there you are. But um, that was, uh, I didn't go into that with people. I, 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 didn't, I did not mention that. Um, there were, um, within, um, within the Academic Advancement Network, there were a couple things that we did, again, design. Um, and so this, this went back to some of the hierarchy. The um, previous way that um, orientation day for new faculty. So um, I don't know if the, the students know, but when, when new faculty come to campus, we don't know where anything is, not even the bookstore. We can't find our office. We don't really know what we're supposed to be doing. And so we need orientation. Um, only our orientation doesn't have as many sort of parties and certainly no beach trips in, in Michigan. That would, I mean, we could have gone, I guess, to Lake Michigan, but at that time of year, the water would have been pretty cold. So we didn't do that. But um, orientation was designed, and so this is a schedule for the day. There was, um, there was uh, a morning session with a bunch of speakers, and you had the, you had, uh, the chancellor, and the EVC would talk, and that was great, and the vice chancellor for research would talk, that, that was all good, and a bunch of other people. And then there would be a special lunch, again, with these folks. They'd be at the lunch. This was great, all the very high-profile people. And then there was a second. There was a second part of the day um, uh, that was um, over here, and this was um, a shorter part of the day. And this would have some talks, but the chancellor was not there. The EVC was not there. For some reason, which you'll see why in a minute why that's odd, the vice chancellor for research was there. So the supervision was for the latter rank faculty only. And the squished down version was for the teaching professors, the research, uh, the research faculty, the research scientists, um, and the, um, uh, the lecturers, the equivalent of Unit 18 lecturers, and so on. Even though two-thirds of the people in the room had no assignment that related to research whatsoever, Vice Chancellor for Research would talk to them about research compliance issues for, you know, 45 minutes. So they always would kind of scratch their heads over that. Um, they knew that they weren't getting lunch and the other folks were getting lunch. And obviously, that was really insulting. Like, why would you give one group lunch and not the other lunch? You know, we're here, we're gonna teach many, many students. Some of us are here, you know, as teaching professors, we're gonna be here for our career. Why are you treating us this way? 
But the old office model had been very much about hierarchy, as you saw, and that uh, preserving distinctions was important. So when I agreed to take over, I said, um, one of the things that we must do is we've got to abolish that model because that model is just insulting people. We had people in this box who were actually married to people in that box. So like they knew, <laughs> they really knew. And um, so we, 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 we ditched that model and we made a new model which overlapped where everybody got lunch and half the people would come in the morning and half the people would come in the afternoon and they were the same program. And that way, if there were a couple who were both hired and maybe they had elder care or child care or I don't know, a dog to walk or something, one could come in the morning and one could come in the afternoon if they wanted to. And everyone could just choose. And it made people so happy. People didn't come away. People used to come away from this first day and they would complain. They would say, you've insulted me on my first day at work. <coughs> and just redesigning the schedule. And the biggest question you might ask is, if any of you are administrators, how did you pay to have lunch for twice as many people? Well, it turned out that lunch was funded by a, a, uh, a, a, um, a uh, corporate partner, um, a credit union, that wanted to meet all the faculty and sign them up for bank accounts <laughs> and mortgages and stuff. So when we approached them and said, you've been a wonderful partner and um, we'd like to put you in front of twice as many customers. <laughs> and we'll arrange a room where if you put a few financial advisors in the room, people will come and ask you about mortgages and there you'll be and, but we need lunch for twice as many people. And they said, sign us up. Sign the check without question. And so it was good for everybody. So the simple schedule design, people then, they liked orientation. They felt welcomed. They felt helped. They got advice. We've had a room for the financial advisors. We made a room, then we realized, for people in benefits. Because another thing, students, the new faculty, we have no clue about benefits. I still don't fully understand my benefits here. I have to go read in detail every time I want to do something. Um, takes a long time, but we put benefits advisors there too. And one of those systems like at a restaurant where you give them the cell phone, not your cell phone number, but kind of a, um, a spoof number and then they'll, they'll be able to text you. And so pe you, people didn't even have to wait in line. So design made, made, made a huge difference. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I'm gonna stop with examples there so that there's time for questions. So let, let me stop there. And if you don't ask questions, I'm going to go back and give you more examples. So you should ask questions so we talk about what you want to talk about. Yeah? It seems to me in the first two examples that you made, uh, what you really found was that getting people together in something old-fashioned called a meeting meant that they were able to exchange information at the same time and then reach better conclusions than sending text Synchronous communication, yeah. sometimes really important. Certainly, certainly for the awards, it was the synchronous communication was absolutely central. For this one, um, we were still in our separate offices, but whenever, if I wanted at midnight to try to solve an issue related to a parental leave, I had all the information and I could kind of see how it was going. Um, um, but this one, absolutely, synchronous communication was the big thing. Yeah. Well, that was more who's a psychiatrist, so he had <laughs> that view of meetings, and I want to expand that. Because yeah. What I think you've done is a really good illustration of what we try to do. Because what you had was some problems, and you were always serving the symptom, mm -hmm. trying to solve the symptoms. And right. when you stepped back and you took what we often teach as a different point of view, Right. And the point of view is systems. Yes. And the way you described the waterfall is you didn't say, wait a minute, this is a system, but you stumbled into it, which is fine. I have right. a big fan of stumbling through to solve problems. And so that's a system, and this is a system. They're each system. That is a system, and solving the system often means the symptoms just disappear. Absolutely. And that's really a great illustration. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, in the, that same spirit, um, so, 
there's this theory, distributed cognition. And if you ask what are the principles of distributed cognition, uh, it's a little hard to articulate them, but there are two that are very central, I think. One is finding the right coordinating structures, mm -hmm. which might be a representation, might be a configuration, mm -hmm. might be a communication latency. Mm -hmm. And another is a big principle that informs a lot of design, which is figuring out what is the right information yes. at the right time, right. at the right place, mm -hmm. in the right form, and at the right pace. Yep. Because there's a pulse to some of that stuff. Absolutely. Each, each one of those represents a pocket of inquiry. Mm -hmm. How to design representations, how to like time them, and right. stuff. And I, I, what is attractive about this to me is that, although these are pretty complicated, each one could itself be a topic for inquiry to understand exactly why that represents a better solution yes. than the previous one. Absolutely. No, that's right. It's like in um, physics where you want to find the coordinate system, that's for example. Right. That's one aspect one. that's, that's going to simplify where things will diagonalize and you can actually see all the components. Yeah, point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And the time. And, and by the way, thank you for demonstrating the effectiveness of diagrams in thinking. Oh, yeah. The, um, <laughs> yeah, too many view graphs in the world. Um, a, a lot of this, it was just a picture, and then the hard part was explaining to somebody the image um, without being able to beam the image to them. Yeah. I was wondering if you could speak to an example of a redesigned process that didn't work so well. Oh, yeah, probably. Let me, let me think about that a second. And by the way, Amy studies the role of diagrams and thinking. Oh, excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me think. One that, one that didn't work. Um, Oh, wait, I had one. I know we tend to suppress those. But yeah, yeah, no, ab ab absolutely. No, I had one, and then, it, and then it flew away. Oh, yeah, OK, OK, here's, okay, here's one. <laughs> OK, this sounded so great in theory. So um, <laughs> I'm a theorist, but that means I know that the data will probably kill 90% of, 99% of my theories. So um, uh, we had, um, uh, chemistry labs, chemistry labs. So our um, our division would have um, 500 students in Gen Chem one each each semester. We had, and there was a constant problem with um, uh, you know the the first year students would not quite realize how delicate all the glassware was, and some glassware would get broken, and then they would feel embarrassed, and they would steal the glassware from their neighbor's drawer, and you know on and on, and and you'd find piles of broken glass somewhere. It's a, yeah, it's not good. So we thought, okay, you know what's what's going on here? And we we had um, we would wind up with a bill at the end of the semester for whatever got broken. And it was enough that um, we were on a pretty tight, tight budget and that, that was a problem for us. And we thought, oh, well, what if we had, um, what if we had the students each chip in, um, you know, we divided it out and it was going to be, I don't know, five bucks, 10 bucks, something small over, over, the, over the number of students. Um, and we thought, uh, we'll have them just each chip in at the beginning of the <coughs> term and then um, if they can show us their lab drawer at the end of the term and they haven't broken anything, we will give them back. We'll keep the amount we need to actually to, to replace the glassware. This, this, right, it all sounds great, right? Only um, what we hadn't factored in was staff time. Some poor staff member was going to have to collect the five bucks and give receipts and keep, and you're going to have to make sure all the lab drawers locked and only the student had the key. It, it created these hideous ripple effects. We tried it for one semester. We said, this is much worse than the way we were doing it. We'll go back to just you know, paying for the glassware because the staff time, I mean, that was, of course, it was also hideously boring for the staff to have to do that. So that was bad. But the cost in staff time was much more than anything we would have saved. So that was, that was a failure. And we, we walked away from that one. And, Yes, I tried to suppress the memory because <laughs> I think that was my idea. So, yeah, <laughs> got to own that one. But, yeah, no, that was a great question. Other questions? Well, you described Michigan State, yeah. which is 
very different than our organization. I'm just sure. I'm curious about your reflections about the differences. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, um, here, I think that um, there's a lot more fluidity between, between divisions. There's um, more openness to having different kinds of units that don't quite exactly follow the mold. Um, and for example, with uh, faculty development, that's one thing I've been thinking about, what we need to do here, just since, it, since it's a topic I'm interested in. Um, and it was one of the things I, t I talked with the chancellor about early on. Um, but I realized that, so at Michigan State, there was, you know, there was this office. And so when we designed the amoeba, we still had that central office because, you know, there were five full-time staff there in that office in addition to the, me and, and my assistant vice chancellors who um, we were all part-time in our roles, but there were permanent staff, so there was still that central node. And I've actually been thinking about how would we do it here? We don't have a central office because different bits of faculty development are being done, some by the vice chancellor of EDI, some by the vice chancellor of research. Teaching and Learning Commons does certain things. I mean, it's kind of spread out all over the place. And so I've been thinking about, um, we'll probably pursue a network without a central node. Because on this campus where the weather is always good, and I have to say, even when y'all tell me, oh, it's raining, be careful when you drive. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm used to driving through this much snow. You can, you can walk anywhere on this campus in probably 10 minutes, and um, the weather is always pretty good. So that means barriers are a lot lower to just going somewhere else. Um, in fact, it's, it's really hard to drive on this campus. Michigan State, you could drive, there was a nice grid so people would drive, and here, oh my gosh, <laughs> after going up my third dead end at night once, trying to find, I don't know what I was trying to find, I was trying to find the faculty club for my office. I can walk there in two minutes, but driving, <laughs> you know, you go around like that, only I went through all these different dead ends and loading docks and stuff. Um, anyway, if here, because you can walk, for so many reasons, um, or ride a bike or whatever, we won't need a central node. Since we don't start with one, we could design without one and be a network um, in a whole different configuration, just purely collaborative, and without anybody even looking like they're fully in charge. And I think that would be better for development because all the different parts really are equally important, and we don't have to have somebody standing there controlling it. So that's one way in which the differences of the campus here, the geography, the, um, the greater fluidity here, I think will change how we do some things. We do need to, I think there are a lot of places on areas on campus where we could coordinate more with one another, we could talk more, and I'm hoping to help us do a bit more of that, but in a way that still leaves the, the main energy out where it is, essentially, yeah. I had, a, I had a question about exception handling, and I love your board on the on the left here because one one read on this is that there was all sorts of cool bottom up innovation, and after you, that happened for a while, you got to be able to classify it and say, oh, here's a common umbrella to unify all these bottom up innovations. And um, I mean, I think one thing a lot of organizations struggle with is the ability to support that kind of bottom up innovation. Precisely because it uh, it chews up outsized resources. You know, yeah. For example, uh, I've run conferences where if you have thirty people on the program committee, the twenty nine that just do their job like they're supposed to take you no time, and the one person who explains that like their cat has a I don't know like right, yeah. there's all like and that one and the same is true with students uh, and and sometimes for good reason and sometimes for less good and reason. sometimes with our faculty colleagues uh, yeah, yeah exactly and that's I've true. been that colleague sometimes well, too you know with the lab with the lab we, we all thing have, yeah right. uh, <laughs> and um, and so I mean one thing that's interesting is how do we make visible how expensive exceptions yes. are so I could be like you know I actually should do that review on time because it costs. The, you know, the, the knock-on costs are enormous. And at the same time, how do we enable, um, like one of my PhD students and I had a fun idea for something to do this summer. And the first answer was, oh, to do something for this summer, you would have needed to tell us by last November. Right? <laughs> right, and so right. It's like, how do you, and I know that the exception takes time, and, and I was just curious about your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it is really good to have um, a method to allow um, anything to be piloted once and then you have to go through all the approvals. That's really important. We had that at Michigan State, at least for certain classes of things. You could try any class once and then you'd have to go through governance, go through Senate to get it really on the books. Yeah, otherwise it's very hard to ever do anything and also if that let you figure out, you could iron out some of the quirks in the first offering and then what you took to Senate was actually much more solid, which was also kind of nice.